Praise the Lord. Let's stand here tonight. Let's start. Amen. Let's lift our hands, our hearts to the Lord. Lord, we praise you here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to worship together, Lord God. Lord, we seek your spirit, Lord God, your word, your wisdom, Lord God, your guidance, your strength here tonight. We ask you, Lord, to be here in the midst of us, Lord. We desire to enter in, Lord God, where there's a transformation of our heart and our mind. Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the glory and the honor, Lord God. You are worthy. You are worthy of all praise, all glory and honor, Lord God. You alone are God. We magnify you. Hallelujah. We thank you for the deliverance. We thank you for the victory that we've got in you, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord, you are worthy, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord, a chain breaker. Hallelujah, deliverer, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord, we magnify you, Lord God. We give you the glory and the honor, Lord God. Oh, you give strength to the weak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You set our feet on higher ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for the victory, Lord God. Hallelujah.
Let 
all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at
Lord God, 
Lord. What a thank blessing, you, Lord. Lord God, Hallelujah. to serve the thank God you, and Lord. creator of this thank universe, you, Lord. Lord. What an honor Hallelujah. to be called by your Hallelujah. name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bear it in your name. Oh, Hallelujah, Jesus, to Lord. serve you. you Glory to your name, we love Jesus. You, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. 
Amen. What a mighty God. What a worthy God we serve. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Amen. You can open your Bibles tonight to Psalm 51. We're, we started doing lessons in Psalms last week. And I was going to do Psalm 2, but I felt very strongly directed to the Lord to go to Psalm 51. So we're going to go there, and we're talking about using psalms for prayers. So when we started looking at psalms last week, we mentioned that psalms are good for learning how to pray. Psalms are good for theology. Psalms are good for learning how to worship and to praise. There's a lot of different things psalms are good for. Psalms are good for learning expressions on how to express yourself to the Lord. Amen. So we're going to look at Psalm 51. We'll start there. We'll read this, the whole psalm. Amen. I think it's one of my favorite psalms in the Bible. Amen. And it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy fa face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from but guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. Do good in thy pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer thy, they offer thy bullocks upon thine altar. Amen. Praise God. So we're talking about learning to pray. We'll probably look at a couple other psalms in conjunction with this concept of learning to pray. As we mentioned, the Psalms are excellent guide for examples on how to pray. The Psalms show examples of proper attitude and words. So there's, there's different things. Sometimes our words are good, but our attitudes are not good. Sometimes our attitude's good, but we don't have the right words. 
And so in prayer, it's communication. I need to tell the Lord what I need or what I want or what I'd like with the right words, the right way, but I also need to have the right attitude when I do that. Amen. The Psalms also reveal a proper approach to God. Okay, sometimes we, we approach God wrong just because we're in the family. I was like kids. Sometimes kids run up to parents and expect them to act a certain way, and you say, wait a minute. I'm doing something now. Hold on. Proper approach. Proper approach. Amen. Sometimes same thing for the Spirit of God. Okay, sometimes prayer doesn't accomplish our intended goal because we don't approach God properly. Psalm 100 shows some of the elements, I should say, of Thanks, or shows the elements of thanksgiving and praise. So whenever you pray, thanksgiving and praise are an essential element. Let's look at Psalm 100. Amen. Psalm 100 verses, verse 4 there. Let's look at that. And it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So in prayer and praise and worship, thankfulness and, and praise is a part of entering into the presence of God. Amen. And the goal in prayer and praise and worship is to get into the presence of God. I mean, not just to have him hear us because he hears us no matter where we are. Even if we're praying wrong, he hears us. He may not answer but it's to get into the presence of God. Amen. So we have to have the proper approach, and Psalm 100 has some elements of that approach. Okay, Psalm 51 is, is a prayer of repentance, basically. It's a prayer of repentance and, and restoration, a request for restoration with the Lord. So when we go back to the psalm, we find out that one of the first things that David is saying, and I think that this is a principle that applies always, always in, in prayer, is you've got to deal with sin first. You've got to deal, we have to deal, I've got to deal, you've got to deal with sin first when we're talking to God. All right, here's some scriptures that help us understand that. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So, in other words, if I allow sin in my heart to be there and I'm dealt with, when I go to pray, God is not going to hear my prayer. So I've got to deal with sin as I start to pray. I've got to make sure that that's right. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the writer says... Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So those are two scriptures that let us understand that when I go to pray and I go to worship and I, and I want to talk to the Lord, I want to praise him and enter into his presence, I must deal with with sin first. And ho hopefully we're dealing with that all along. Psalm 19 shows the principle that sometimes we've got sin we don't know about. All right, so we look over in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, verse 12 says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. In other words, I don't even know sometimes if I've done wrong in God's eyes. So I need to ask God to search me and cleanse my heart. Okay, and, and how do those things happen? Usually it's not a direct violation of the word in the sense of, you know, I stole or I lied or I killed things or how maybe we treat each other. And, and when that's working, that creates a problem in our lives and we have to ask God to search us. So sometimes... The problem is not necessarily the knowledge of the word, but maybe our interactions are based on the way we've been raised 
or the culture we live in, and that's violating what God wants. Amen? So he said, he says, he's saying this. It shows us. He says, who can know his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. In other words, sometimes we presume it's okay when it's not with God. And we sin because we make the presumption it's okay. So we presume, keep back from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Again, Psalm 139 brings this out. Verses 23 and 24, another great psalm. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes we've got to ask, not sometimes, many times, we've got to ask the Lord to search us. We've got to give the Lord permission to search us in order to make sure, because again, sometimes we think we are okay when in fact we're not in God's eyes. We may be okay with each other and everybody else, but we're not okay with God. Amen? Amen. And it's very important. So our hearts will deceive us. This is why we have to ask the Lord. So Jeremiah 17, the principle, again, that he brings out, the heart is desperately wicked. The heart is desperately wicked. That is the unregenerated heart, the heart that God does not have control of, the carnal heart. The carnal heart, we will trick ourselves. We will deceive ourselves. Okay, so the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give to every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his doings. Amen. So sometimes, I mean, God's always going to bring it out eventually. But if we're trying to live for God, we don't want God to bring it out where we're crashing on the rocks. Right? It's kind of like the scripture Jesus said. If you fall on the rock, you'll be broken, but you'll be okay. But if you let the rock fall on you, you're going to be ground to powder. So if I go and fall on Jesus... I repent, I let Jesus break me in my sins, I'll be okay. But if I wait till Jesus decides he's going to break me, it's going to grind me. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we have to, our hearts deceive us. It's the Lord that searches the hearts. We look over to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, the last part of verse 23. When we look there, Revelation 3, 23, the last part says, I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. I will give to every man according to every one of you according to your works. Now, reins, both here in the New Testament and the Old Testament, technically the word, word literally means the kidney. But the idea is some, an organ that represents your innermost thoughts, emotions, will, and being. So this is what it is. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament here, this word here reigns, nephos, is related to the same Hebrew word that's tra translated reigns in 90% of the places in the Old Testament. For, yeah, I, read, I just did the last line of that slide there. Oh, chapter 2, sorry, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. chapter 2, that's what he's saying, thank you, all right, so our reins represent our innermost being and our motive, so we need to let the G Jesus, we need to let the Lord serve our, check our heart, now I think I skipped over something before, when, when he starts, when, G when David starts the Psalms there, he makes that statement that, Lord, have mercy unto me. Did I miss that? Well, wherever, we'll get there. 
But the Lord is the standard of right and wrong. This, this is, again, this is a problem today. Even for people going to Christ, churches, calling themselves Christians, people that call, even that call themselves apostolic, that are baptized in Jesus' name, they got the Holy Ghost, believe in one God, even have a holiness standard. Many people are using their own standard of right and wrong and not the Bible. And it's a problem. Okay, so the Lord is the standard for all right and wrong. That means since the Bible is his word, the Bible is the standard for all right and wrong. Amen? So Isaiah 44, 24 says, Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Let's go look at, look at it. Isaiah 44, 24, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He's the supreme maker, isn't he? Amen? He's the supreme maker. Chapter 45, verse 22 and 23, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Be saved. Look unto me, all ye ends, and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. So what, what am I saying here? Since he made everything and he's going to judge everything, he is the law. That's the point that I'm trying to bring out with those scriptures. He is the law. Now you got people that don't believe that. You got people even speaking in tongues that don't believe that. Well, that's okay, but I, I don't think I need to be modest. Well, that, that's okay, but I, you know, I don't, I'll, I'll be my own judge about this and that. Amen. But, but if God puts you in a congregation, you need to come under the authority of that congregation. And you need to come and, and have a unified approach to the world in the things that you're representing. Amen. And so Jesus will be the judge in 2 Timothy 4 and 1. Second Timothy 4 and 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Of course, we know Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. So it's another way of saying that he's the lawgiver, right? He's the lawgiver. Again, 1 Peter 4 and 5. who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So we all have to give an account to the Lord sometime. And when we give an account, it won't be our opinion, society's opinion, your opinion, our culture, our government, our nation, our denomination. It's not going to be any of those things. It's going to be the word of God that God is going to hold up before us. And so culture understanding, preference, laws, governments, social acceptance do not override the law of God. Doesn't happen. Amen. Okay, and, 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 but again, there's many people that think it's okay. Psalm 119.89 tells us that God's word is already settled in heaven forever. That means he's not remaking it. So forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Again, in, in Psalm, or not Psalm, but Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Let 
And Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, even before that time has come to pass, God, way back, has declared what's going to happen back there. He's declaring the end, how it's going to end up, right back in the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning. He's declaring that, okay? And then he says, And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So again, it leads to, we need the Lord to search our hearts. He's God. We're not God. He's going to have his way. Now, one, one of the side things, you know, it's, it's nice that we've got a lot of versions of the Bible today, but in, in another sense, it's not good. Because you know what it does? It gives people the idea, well, if I don't like that translation, I'll find one that I do like. And so now people have this idea that there's really many ideas or ways to interpret the Word of God when there really aren't. Praise God. Amen. Now, do I use other versions? Yeah, I do. But, but this, is my, this, is my, this is where I anchor from. Okay? This is where I anchor from. And I compare it to this. And what God's already showed me what this should mean. And so when I start looking at other ones, I look at that, I look at the other ones, and I, I don't just look at the verse, but I look at it in the context of the whole Bible. Because sometimes, if you even go look that word up, that word is an acceptable translation of the raw word, but it's wrong in the context of the Bible or the New Testament or Old Testament. It's very important because the devil wants to shift us. He wants to shift people. He wants to make you think that there's really no absolutes. That's why people are doing the things they're doing today. That's why they're running to and fro. Most of them, even if they go to church and, and give lip service to God or even have had the Holy Ghost, in their mind and thinking and in their emotions, there's no absolutes. So when you tell them this is what the Bible says, they weasel around it because there's no absolutes. And they don't even know they're doing it for the most part a lot of times. It's, it's not a conscious thing. They've absorbed it from society around them. So David, in verse 1 of Psalm 51, back to that, first thing he says is, Have mercy upon me, O God. Have mercy upon me. Now, this is interesting because that phrase is only found in the Psalms, have mercy upon me. And it's only found in the Psalms written by David. And it's found eight times. So eight times in the Psalms, David says in different ways, have mercy upon me. I need an answer. Have mercy upon me. Deliver me. Have mercy upon me. Show me your presence. Different ways. He says... Have mercy upon me. And it's eight times. And I think eight is significant because eight means a new beginning. Well, when I'm praying to God and I'm trying to break through, I need a new beginning. Amen. When, I, when, I, when I'm repenting and I need God to restore me, I need a new beginning. Amen. And so David understands, you know, that when I'm going to get a new beginning, the first thing I need to do is go to the Lord and say, have mercy upon me. Yeah, he's God. We're children of God. But he's, but, and he's our Heavenly Father, but we still need to understand that there's a relationship where we need to ask God to have mercy on us. Amen. So David requests that his transgressions are blotted out. So verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In other words, I recognize... I have sinned. And of course, the context for Psalm 51 is David is confronted with his sin by Nathan, with his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's husband. He's confronted with that. And when David is confronted, he realizes 
he needs to repent. So he writes this psalm. This is how David feels about what he is confronted with. Amen. So he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. He understands, I need you to cleanse me. God, I'm dirty. I need you to restore me. Amen. Then David acknowledges his sin in verse 3 and 4. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Amen. Acknowledging that we're wrong, that's key. That's an absolute key attitude in repentance, isn't it? But we know that repentance is turning from sin to God. But I think David's even going a step further than this. I think he's not only saying, okay, God, I sinned. I recognize that, I, that I've done the wrong thing. You know, a person can sin and acknowledge they've done the wrong thing and turn from their sins, but yet not really give God his authority, his, his place as God in their life, the maker of law, the right to make those laws, and the right to ask us to come under them. Am I going over your head? Okay. I think that's important. Because again, I'm, I'm going to say that we've seen people come in, they get convicted by their sin, and they repent and turn towards God, but somewhere in their heart, they're a little grudging that they got to do it God's way. They're not really acknowledging it's not my life. God gave it to me. I don't own it. God has given it to me. And if that's the way God wants me to do it, I want to do it his way. Change my heart, God. Amen. So he, so he says, I'm acknowledging. And what he's saying is that I'm letting you understand that you're not going to have to come to me and say, you violated. I'm acknowledging I did it. You're not going to have to come to me and say, this is my law and I expect you to do it. I'm going to admit I knew this was your law. I broke it. I'm wrong. Amen. You don't have to come to me and work it out with me or convince me. I recognize I'm wrong, that you can be justified when you come to me. You don't have to say a thing. I accept it. Praise God. Amen. So this is total repentance David's doing. Amen. And then he says in, in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All that David is saying here is, all men are sinners. All men are born of sinners. David is not saying, I'm an, I was conceived illegitimately. He is not saying that. He's not saying that his mother had some kind of an affair with somebody and he was conceived illegitimately. He's saying, I was shapen in iniquity. In other words, he's saying the same thing. Romans 3, 23 says, all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Same thing Romans 5 is saying. He's saying because a one man sinned in, into the world and all have come under sin. So David's just saying, even when I was conceived and I don't know different between good and bad I'm just being conceived even while my, my embryo is still forming once I become what God considers to be a human being amen and that's at conception I believe once that happens I'm still a sinner so that's part of David's plea for mercy God you know I'm a man shaping iniquity Yes, I did wrong. I violated your law. You got a right to judge me. You are the righteous God. But God, I got a sin nature. I got a sin nature. Help me. Forgive me. Help me understand. Understand where I'm coming from. Amen. Then he goes on to say in verse 6, Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt not thou shalt make me to know wisdom that's what god is looking for he wants us to have truth on the inside truth on the inside 
Not just a bunch of laws that we know and we conform to. But in our heart, truth. Truth in the heart. We conform to the laws because of the truth in our heart. Not the truth in our mind, the truth in our heart. Relationship brings restrictions. The closer you get to God, the more restrictions you'll have in your life. Amen. The closer you get to God, the more restrictions you will have in your life. It's like a, it's like a servant or a slave, right? You got a master, he's got a household of slaves. Some servants will never see that master face to face, or they may see him once or twice, or maybe once a year. They're out in the field. They don't see him, they see their taskmaster or the man assigned to him. But if you're a servant in the household waiting on the Lord, and you see him every day, now you're looking, you're waiting, you're on standby to see if his hand says, Come here. You're watching. You've got to pay more attention to what the master wants and react quicker because you're closer to the master. God desires truth in the inward parts. Amen. Amen. The Lord wants our hearts. Again, Psalm 19 and 4. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Not just my actions, not just what I speak, but the meditations of my heart. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let it be acceptable, and I say because God desires truth in the inward part. Now, in, in Matthew, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, this is one of the things I think that was amazing the people that were hearing him. It wasn't that Jesus was really saying anything that the law didn't say, but because the way the law was and people didn't have the spirit, they had grown to the point that as long as I outwardly observe, I'm going to be okay. As long as I outwardly observe, it's going to be okay. But Jesus brings it back. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. So in, in Matthew 5.20, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What's he mean? He means it's not good enough just to do it. Your heart has got to be in it. Then he goes on to give some examples. You've heard that it was said in old time that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the ju judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, or thou fool, shall also be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So what's he saying? He's saying your emotion of it, the inward person. God is interested in the inward person. And when he goes on and says the other things, you know, when he talks about looking at a, a woman in adultery, it's not just that you don't do it, but Where's your heart? The inward man. So this is what Jesus is bringing out. This is why kind of was kind of amazing them. They knew these laws, but now somebody's telling them, it's not just the outward actions. Your heart needs to be right. Amen? So then he says, purge me with hyssop. And again, David's he's really on this thing of, I want to be clean before God. I want to be right with God. I don't want God to just forgive me and make everything okay that I don't have to worry, but I want to be right with God. Amen. Not just trying to escape penalties. I want to be right with God. 
Amen. So he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Well, hyssop, when you start to study it in the Bible, it's used in applying the blood and it's used in cleansing. So in Exodus, when the, the death of the firstborn, that 10th plague was going to come, they took hyssop and applied the blood to the doorway, the two side posts and the upper door posts, the lintel. So hyssop applied blood. But also when the leper was cleansed, when they did the ceremony of cleansing, they threw hyssop into the water with scarlet. And when, and when they made the water of purification with the red heifer, where they burned the heifer's ashes, they put hyssop in the water there. So hyssop is for applying the blood, and it's also for cleansing. David's saying, give me the maximum cleansing. Man, give it to me all the way. Put the blood on me, amen, and put all the cleansing you can put on me, God. Give me the maximum cleansing. Purge me with hyssop. Hallelujah. Amen. He was admitting his need to be covered by the blood and cleansed like a leper. Then he says in verses 8 and 9, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Now it's not that God had literally broke his bones, but what, if my bones are broken, I can't stand. If my bones are broken, I can't do normal things, right? My leg bones are broken, I can't stand, okay? If my spiritual bones are broken, I can't stand in God's presence. Amen, you've broken me, God, so much I can't stand. Restore it so that I can stand in your presence. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. So David's restoring, he's praying for restoration of relationship. Amen. Then he comes to that great verse, verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, remove and renew a right spirit within me. So even after we've repented and acknowledged our sin, we need God to do a work in us. We need the Lord to do a work in us. Sometimes we don't ask God to do something in us that needs to be done. Amen. So we need to repent. But sometimes we need to ask God, God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Some, sometimes we, our sin is, we're okay. We haven't, we're not in sin. We've confessed it. But our attitude is not right. And we need to say, renew a right spirit within me, O oh God. We need to ask God, to change how the inner man is. We need to understand that God gives us a sovereign will. He gives us the freedom to do what we want with our will and life. Because of that, there's some things you've got to ask God to do inside of you. He's not going to override your will or your sovereignty. So sometimes we need to ask God, change me. Sometimes that's why we go on the same way. Because we're not willing to let God change us. So David acknowledges it. it's the Lord who cleanses our heart, gives us a new heart. And this is why the new birth is essential. Because it's the new birth that gives us a new heart. People can come to church. Sinners can be convicted and, and honestly repent. But if they don't get a new heart, they'll go back to where they came from. Once the fear of the pain and the penalty and the situation is lifted. If they don't get a new heart, the carnal heart will take over and they will go back to where they came from, even though they sincerely repented. Amen? So let's look at, let's look at that. Okay, 
All men are sinners. The natural man I'm born doesn't understand God's ways, Romans 3.23, which we already said, but also Romans 8, 6, and 7. Just a little capsulation, because there's other verses you could bring in there that would, would apply. But Romans 8, 6, 7 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity or an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. That's the carnal mind is man, woman, without God, without God's spirit inside of them. Amen. First Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, the carnal man cannot understand the things of God. Doesn't understand why. Doesn't understand, you know, how come I have to do it that way? Or why can't I do it this way? Because it's their carnality, their natural desires that are driving them, not the Spirit of God. All right, so Ezekiel 36 or Jeremiah 31, 33, God brings it out. God said, I got a solution for the problem. All right, Jeremiah 31, 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Law in the inward part, write it in their hearts. Ezekiel 36, 26. Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. The fact that God is saying this in the Old Testament to Israel is evidence they don't have the right heart. Even though they've got a law, and a testimony, and a history, and, and God has called them his people and chosen them, their hearts need to be changed. Amen? So Hebrews 10, 8 and 10 refers to Jeremiah 31, 33, letting us understand that the New Testament brings that fulfillment. When we get the Holy Ghost, God changes our heart. God gives us a new heart. So Hebrews 8 and 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law into their mind, my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. He's quoting back from Jeremiah 31, 33. And again in Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds will I write them. Okay, so David is saying, this is all under creating me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. We've got to ask God to do these things. Just because we've got the Holy Ghost doesn't mean we just cruise. We do have access because of the Holy Ghost, but we have to seek God. That's why Amos said, seek God and you're going to live. Seek me and you'll live. Amen. Praise God. Then he says in, in verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Sin will prevent us from entering into the presence of, God, of the Lord. Now, it's not that the Lord is actually going to take his spirit away from us in this dispensation we live in. However, we can walk away from God. So in John 10, 27 and 29, again, we've got sovereign will. 
Just because you got saved, just because I got saved or you got saved, God does not take away my sovereign will. Amen? So I still, I still need to yield to God. I still need to yield. And, and even with the Holy Ghost, the Bible lets us understand there's a struggle between the flesh and the spirit, the carnal and the spiritual mind, right? And so I've got to learn to yield to the spiritual mind and reject the carnal mind to make the spiritual mind stronger. If I yield to the carnal mind more, I strengthen the carnal mind and weaken the spirit. If I yield to the spirit, I strengthen the spirit and, and weaken the carnal. All right, so what often happens to us, is, even as apostolics, we got truth, we come to church, we get filled with the Holy Ghost, we come into his presence, we get renewed, everything's good. But when we go out and live our daily life, we're often yielding to the carnal more than the spirit. And by, by yielding to the spirit, I don't, mean that, I don't think that means you've got to go out and start fasting three days a week, seven days a week, or things like that. I don't think it means that. I think what you need to do is listen to God. If God says fast, fast. But it does oftentimes mean I've got to put some things aside that I like to do that are not wrong and take time to seek God. Take more time to seek God. Make sure the things I'm doing, are they helping me live for God? And when I do that, I'm strengthening the spiritual mind. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So, again, and, and man is in italics, so it's implied. So, basically, we can say nothing or no one can pluck you out. That's true. But again, I got a free will, you got a free will. I can walk out of God's hands. You can walk out of God's hands. Amen. Praise God. So when, when we're looking at this verse, he says, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit. We have to understand that verse in the context of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost was not given as a general gift. Okay, the Holy Ghost as a general gift does not come until the day of Pentecost. But in the Old Testament, God did give people the Holy Ghost. Amen? So we have to look at Matthew 3 and 11, this, which shows that the, the Gospels are setting up people for the Holy Ghost. They're laying the groundwork. That's part of what John the Baptist is trying to do. They're laying the groundwork because God is now going to come in a different way. He's going to be available not just to the high priest or the kings or the elders, but he's now going to be available to the average person, whoever wants the Lord. So he says in, in Matthew 3 and 11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoe I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So John's talking about a bigger, greater baptism. Amen? Okay, John 7, 37. Again, now Jesus is talking about a greater baptism. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And then again in John 14, on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus is talking about the coming of his Spirit, or the Holy Ghost being made available to all people. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth them not, 
neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So he's telling you plainly of what he's talking about the Spirit is him coming back in the Spirit. Amen. So notice, in Isaiah 63 and 11, the Bible says that Moses had the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 63 and 11, Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? So Moses had the Holy Ghost even in the Old Testament. Now, you know, when we look at the Gospels, right, we call it New Testament, but technically it's still Old Testament. Because the new covenant is not given till the day of Pentecost. So the Bible says John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his birth. Amen. So God did give the Holy Ghost to people before the day of Pentecost, but it was not a general gift that everybody could receive. All right? But now, so what were, what were we talking about when he says, can't take not your Holy Spirit away from me. David is living in a different dispensation. And God was not giving his spirit in the same way to everybody. So you have to think about that verse in terms of the Old Testament dispensation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Verse 12. Psalm 51, verse 12. It says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, when I, when I read this psalm and I read other psalms of David, it becomes clear to me that he knows what the Holy Ghost is like. David had the Holy Ghost. He received, He had that Holy Ghost within him. He knew what the presence of God was like. Because if he didn't know what the presence was like, what is he saying, restore unto me? Your presence. What's he asking for? For restoration. God's forgiven him. If he's got faith in God, and obviously David has faith in God. But he's asking for something that he has experienced that goes beyond what most people had experienced. Amen. And so he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knows the presence of God. It's more than just a miracle. He has experienced the presence of God. Restore unto the joy known from your salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That, that's more than just knowing that I'm saved, that God forgave me. He's experienced something that lets him know. There really is a joy to salvation. There's a joy to being in God's presence. And then he says in verse 15, Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth praise. Now to me, that verse says, David understands what it's like to speak under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. When you open my mouth, I'll show forth praise. It's beyond his will. He's not talking about the will, by my will I'll praise. Because David also said, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. But he's saying, open down my lips and my mouth shall give forth praise. He's talking about an experience. He understood what it was like to have the Spirit of God move upon him. And what came out of his mouth was the result of that Spirit of God in his life. It's a type of getting the Holy Ghost way back in the Old Testament. Praise God. Amen. Remember when David was talking about the temple, he said, all these plans, I've given it unto Solomon. He said, I received it by the Spirit of the Lord in writing. God moved upon him and he wrote it out. Amen. Solomon built it, but God gave the pattern to David. David knew what it was like to be in the presence of God. Amen.
Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach sinners thy ways. Then will transgressors be converted unto thee. Joy is essential to be a good witness. That's why the devil tries to create problems and get us down so much. Because he knows that joy is necessary to be a good witness witness. Not occasional joy, but a more abiding joy. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, you need strength to live for God. You need strength to witness for God. You need strength to follow the path of God. But the joy gives us strength to continue on the path. It's like that song that Sister Olet like there's joy in the journey. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Joyful praise is the beginning of our entrance into the presence of the Lord, right? Psalm 100, 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come before his presence with singing. Amen. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, and his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. But... On the way there, make, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. There's got to be some joy. And it's hard to be thankful without joy, isn't it? The Bible says, in everything give thanks. But it's hard to really do that if my joy is all sucked away. Amen? Amen. So Psalm 5, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 also lets us understand that and everything give thanks, but it starts out with rejoice in the Lord always, or it says constantly. Okay, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Before I ever get to thanks, I've got to rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing. Amen. Without joy, your light's not going to have the strength. It's going to be dim. When you lose your joy, your light's dim. You still got a light, but it's dim. It doesn't shine as strong. Amen? So Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The joy. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach sinners thy ways and transgressors shall be converted unto you. Amen. And again, Philippians 2 and 14, 15, do all things without murmurings, disputings, that you may be blameless, harmless, the sons of light, without rebuke. Amen. In this generation. So God wants us to understand that. Okay, we need joy. So David understood this prayer of confession. I don't just want to be forgiven and everything's okay and under the rug and I go on being king, but I want a restoration of relationship. I want your spirit again. I want the joy of salvation again. I want to be a witness. God, how is, that, how, how is it possible from the depths that I've fallen to be a witness? But you're God. If you purge me, if you wash me, I can be a witness. Praise God. Then we get down to verses 16 and 17 again. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. So now we're getting down to what God, God is really looking for. Amen? Amen. Now, David understood. There's no Levitical sacrifice I can give for adultery. The penalty is death. There's no Levitical sacrifice I can give for murder. The penalty is death. Amen. He understands that. Amen. So, but what he's saying is, you're not really asking for a sacrifice because you've never even given. There's no sacrifice you've ever specified that I can give you for this. What you really want, God, is my heart. Broken and contrite heart, O oh God, 
that I will not despise. Now, to me, broken and contrite is talking about not again, not only just asking God to be forgiven, but I'm sorry that I offended God. I'm sorry I offended God. God, I'm sorry I messed up and disappointed you, God. This is where David's at. I'm sorry that I, that I missed it. And again, the Lord wants us to serve him willingly with joy, but, but our resistance. Sometimes we're doing what God wants us to do, but we're grudgingly doing it. But he's looking for the heart that says, okay, God, that's what I got to do, then I want to do it, and I want to do it with joy unto you. Amen? And again, we see this that in Psalm 34, 18, that God likes the contrite heart. Isaiah 57, 15, the Bible says that God dwells in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and broken spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to restore the heart of the contrite one. God is going to do that. Let's look at that verse. I didn't say it quite right. Is it 57, 15? For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. See, if, if I'll get a humble and contrite heart, if I'll give God the heart he wants, God will revive me. God will revive you. And it goes to Romans 12 and 1, New Testament, right? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Amen? All right, so let's look at some principles. We're done. Let's just review, because there's a lot of principles in that psalm. Okay, number one, we need to ask the Lord for mercy. Okay, have mercy upon me. Well, that's automatic, Lord. But again, Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I've got to go to the throne of grace to get the mercy. I've got to ask God. All right? Repentance is a turning point from sin to God and also an acknowledgement that the Lord is right and just. He's got a right to make the laws. He's God. The Lord wants truth in the inward being, not just action or form. Only the Lord can create a clean heart in us and renew a right spirit in us. You must be in right standing to be a proper witness. But if I'm in right standing, I'll have the joy of the Lord. You'll have the joy of the Lord. And the sacrifice that the Lord is looking for is a submitted heart. Now, you know, sometimes people are doing things and their heart's not right. And they know it's the right thing to do. But because their heart's not right, they, they give up and say, well, I'm not going to do it because my heart's not right. No, that's, that's not the right thing to do. What you need to do is continue to do the thing and ask the Lord to change your heart. Change my heart, oh God, okay? This may sound funny, but years ago I went to a training called Gabriel Richard where they would teach you to speak in front of people. And I was petrified of speaking in front of people. And what they would do is have you get up and do things that you felt uncomfortable doing. And the saying was, if you act the way you want to be, soon you'll be the way you act. Well, it was true. If you started to act like you could do it, eventually you learned you could do it. Amen. And so it's the same thing with God. If, if you know you're doing something, but your heart's not right, 
Continue to do what God is asking you to do. And ask God to change your heart. And God will change your heart. Amen. Psalm 51. Let's stand tonight. Let's ask the Lord to help us here tonight. Lord God, we look at your word here tonight. Sometimes when we see all the things in the word, it really makes us feel worse than better. But Lord, you know each one of us where we're at. You're not expecting us all to grow at the same rate. You're not expecting us all to be the same. Lord, you know our hearts, what our struggles are. We're asking you, Lord, to search us, search our hearts, change our hearts. Bring us to the place where we want to give our hearts to you and do things the way you want them. Bring us to the place and through the waters where we see you are the great loving God. You are the God that cares more for us than we care for ourselves. And that your plan and your thoughts are of good things for us, Lord God. But in our carnality, we resist. In our ignorance, we can't see. Not understanding that when you change our heart, the things that we find difficult or don't want to do, we'll willingly do because we've been in your presence and we love you, Lord God. Help us here tonight as we get ready to leave this place, we pray. Lord, and we give you the praise. Just give them some praise. Lord, we thank you here tonight. We praise you, Lord God. You are worthy. You are worthy. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for that blood that washes whiter than snow, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. You know our frame, Lord God, that our names are written in heaven. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that we can do it with you. We can do all things through you, Lord God. We give you the praise, Lord God. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. Help us to gird up the loins of our minds, to arm our minds here tonight, Lord God, and give you the praise and glory. Change us to be what you want us to be, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. 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 God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Amen.